guys can all time yourselves because I have to keep myself on mute uh, because I have noisy birds in the background and that's probably a bit disruptive to you guys trying to debate. Can we please confirm the motion? Uh, yes. We're doing the um, uh, charities should focus on climate change instead of poverty one. Thank you. All right. Whenever you're ready, Will. Two problems we're faced with trading off in this debate are both hugely significant problems that have a large impact on people around the world. What we are saying in this debate is that private donations to charities that focus on global poverty are far more effective at using that money as charities that are focusing on climate change solutions. And we're going to prove that down the line. What do we support? We support charity acting in its most efficient form and that private charity will focus on global poverty. We think government policy will obviously like tackle both global poverty and uh, climate change, but we think specifically all the like duty to tackle climate change lies on the government there. What we're going to prove to you today is one of two things. Firstly, that charities have a duty to help the global poor in a way that can't be done by tackling climate change, or we prove that by helping the poor leads to a better utilitarian outcome in terms of trading off climate change and global poverty. I'm going to bring three points to the house today. Firstly, about why private uh, charities have a duty to help the global poor. Secondly, about why we get more effective charity on our side of the house. And finally, about how solving poverty actually helps climate change reduction in more ways than you'd expect. But firstly, oh, and then uh, Nick will split and talk about uh, how we get more pressure on governments to solve climate issues. Firstly, let's talk about why private charities have a duty to help the global poor. We think the like primary duty of charity is to alleviate suffering in the most effective way possible, right? So that's like we we would always prioritize like say a charity that is like saving lives from malaria is doing its job better than a charity that's like I don't know funding an art museum or something. But we think there's two principles that are particularly important here. We think firstly that we prioritize tangible immediate change. Why is that? We think generally the people who are likely to be the victims of climate change are likely to be people who haven't been born yet. And as such, they currently do not have the means for suffering. And as the number of them who will be born will probably change in response to how climate change goes, the amount of total suffering that will occur from that will also change consequentially. So that means we think we should prioritize reducing suffering that definitely exists as we know we can solve it. The second thing to note here is that we think we have a specific burden as part of like the global private charity community to like alleviate poverty. Why is this? Because the systems that gained, gave donors money and the ability to donate more was the same system that was based on the exploitation of the world's poor. So that's a system of colonialism, of the gutting of resources in less economically developed countries, and that system that's pushed the scales of power in favor of those who currently have the money. And now those people with the money want to give back to the world. We think they have a duty to give back in the form that they actually, like, they or the systems that help put them in that positive place help to create. So we think the way to do that is to tackle global poverty. Of course, the negating team will say that climate change hurts the poor the most, right? But we note here that the poor people are only vulnerable to climate change because they are poor and like can't, move, can't afford to move out of the place that is vulnerable to climate change. We think if we can make them richer, we can make them adaptable. Secondly, let's talk about why we get more effective charity. And this is quite important, right? Because it means that we've proven that this charity is just better even if you were uh, calculating it utilitarian. So we think that the setup of charities is to uh, prevent immediate suffering, as we said. There's four ways that charities do this in a good way. First, uh, charities that uh, tackle global poverty do this in a good way. Firstly, we know what works for global poverty, right? The results are immediate and measurable. It's things like people having a higher standard of living, being able to live with things they couldn't have otherwise done, being not being riddled by like worms and malaria in sub-Saharan Africa in a way that would otherwise happen. But secondly and importantly, it's much easier to show your results and be accountable. And this is important for two reasons, right? Because rich people who are like, who are business minded and have got their money because they're like savvy with money and now like want to see results because that's just the sort of person they are. They can see those results when they're tangible short-term results, 
also it's easier to sell to the public right you get more donors coming in and like more donors who are maybe middle class because they can see the stories of the people you are helping you can put that world vision ad of that child that you've literally saved from uh, like a disease ridden life of poverty and starvation that gets more people involved so ultimately it's not a zero sum game on outside the house you get more donors at the end of that mechanism but also notice, and importantly, quite vitally, is that you get much higher marginal returns. So you have charity like uh, organizations like GiveWell that can measure how like how effective your money is. You can save a life by donating ten thousand dollars to the Against Malaria Foundation. You can't do anything near like that with uh, climate change reduction. Finally, we just think it's easier to sell to companies, right? Because it doesn't run directly count uh, like in direct opposition to their policies of like development and like ruining the climate. We think companies are less likely to get on board if you're like restricting what they can do. But let's look at the comparative about investment in climate change. Two things to note. Firstly, there's going to be much less of it because of the absence of reasons of the reasons we've just given. So even if they were just as effective, there'd be less of this donation to climate change research uh, and that just would be worse at providing positive outcomes. But secondly, importantly, let's talk about ineffective targeting because charities want to show results, if we, as we've already explained, to get donations. Three problems with this for climate change. Firstly, that means they're probably going to invest in short-term solutions where you can say you've done something, even though that might not be the best thing you can do to tackle climate change. For example, you might say you've cleaned up all the plastic in the ocean, or you're focusing on the impacts of climate change, but you're not actually reducing uh, how bad it gets. Secondly, you focus on solutions in rich countries where the marginal return is much lower because that's where climate change research is currently happening. So maybe your scientists need millions of donations to get a slightly more efficient wind turbine. We think that money could have saved like thousands of people dying of malaria, much better to go to that. Thirdly, we just talk about greenwashing. We think often these solutions aren't actually solutions. They just are companies wanting to like get more, uh, get more consumers because they look good. So at the end of this point, we think it's much less important. Let's talk about why solving poverty actually helps climate change reduction though. Because this is important because if you're just weighing this debate on a utilitarian standpoint, which we don't think you should, then we still win, right? Because recognize that pollution doesn't come from countries like Germany. It comes from countries like India and China and Bangladesh and Nigeria, where people literally don't have the ability to make a, a, like uh, climate change conscious decisions. When people are poor, they can't change their basic needs in order to accommodate for climate change. Secondly, recognize that if these people did have more money, they can like do things like political activism because they have the time to do that. And like uh, economic development becomes self-fulfilling at that point. And that's what matters, right? Because the real thing that stops climate change isn't private donations to help the effects of it. It is government regulation to stop companies polluting. Thirdly, we just think in the long term, you, when you empower more people in the developing world with education, et cetera, they are best able to solve their problems, their local problems in a way that is specific, specific to them and that you will never get on the other side of the house. But moreover, long term, globally, we think it's just better, like in the very long term, to have lots of like innovation centers across the globe. So like research just comes at a higher output if you have a whole lot of people at the ability to produce research. At the end of this point, we are the side that focuses on the long term in terms of climate change. And we recognize that charities have a limited ability to help climate change in the short run by actually making people less poor. They're able to make climate change a, a solvable problem in the long term. And not only do they have that, they have an obligation to do so. Proud to affirm. I'd like to take the first affirmative speaker and invite the first negative speaker to open negative side. You guys can hear me? Hi, mom. Yes. Perfect. 
Look, Will's right that he has to be comparative in this debate in terms of talking about the relative efficiency of charity working in the sphere of poverty versus wearing, working in the sphere of climate change. Uh, but that's why it's problematic that he didn't talk at all about the ways in which charities actually spend their money and why that's likely to be uh, like more efficient in the sphere of poverty than it is in climate change. That's where I'm going to spend the majority of my speech focusing. I'm going to talk to you about two things. First, I'm going to do a quick assessment of the relative importance of the two issues that are being weighed up in this debate, climate change versus poverty, in terms of the ability to save lives in general. And then third, secondly, I'm going to walk you through specifically why charities are inefficient in the way that they tackle poverty and why they are likely to be much more efficient in the sphere of climate action. Most of my rebuttal is going to be integrated, but the first thing I would deal with is just the principle that we'll talk about. Mostly we think it was just a waste, uh, you know, a waste of a, a section of a speech for a couple of reasons. One, the first principle that he gave basically is that we should prioritize tangible change. Fundamentally, this is a utilitarian you know, principle. If we're 99% sure that people in the future are going to suffer in ways that we can measure from climate change, I think that's close enough to 100% that we're able to say that we're principally and justified in saving those people. It's not like there's a 20% chance that people might suffer from climate change down the line. It's much larger than that. And in fact, it's actually an immediate harm as well. So the point that we should focus on current harm isn't, you know, isn't relevant because people actually are suffering in many ways from displacement due to climate, from famine, from storms, all those kinds of things in the present. So that's not relevant. Second he said, well, we have a colonial, uh, you know, colonial past, we have principles based on that. Yes, we're going to say the obvious thing that Will thought we were going to say, that climate change sufferers are, in fact, the global force. They're still solving the same thing. But he then further goes on to say, well, you should make them richer and then they can save themselves. Problem. A, that's not true. There's lots of places where the global poor, for example, when you're if you're on the coast or if you live in the Maldives, for example, aren't able to sell, save themselves. But secondly, it's entirely unfeasible to say that in the next 20 years or so, you're going to be able to make Iraq and like other places in, in, the, in the Middle East, for example, as wealthy as, as like the West. And the reality is that when those countries are faced with increasing desertification and famine, they cannot continue to build their economies. They're going to be doomed to poverty in those places. And in fact, in many circumstances, due to famines that have already occurred there, they already already have been doomed to poverty. So if you want to focus on making people rich, you actually should focus on climate change. It's not just something that's going to take place 50 years from now. It's a problem that we face now. Turning then to my first point, it's about the relative importance of these issues. And this is going to be fairly brief because it's, you know, it's, it's basically just a contextual point. What we want to say is we support the sorts of things that charities might do, for example, investing in green technologies, for example, lobbying governments or engaging in media campaigns or potentially doing things as simple as going out and planting a zillion zillion trees. We think those are things that can be really important. Why is that? Well, let's weigh out the two issues in this debate. We say the numerical number of people that are likely to suffer as a number as a, as a direct result of climate change is larger than the number of people who are likely to, to suffer from climate change uh, from poverty in the next 50 years. Why is that? One, poverty is already decreasing at a massive rate. And or, as I'm going to explain in the rest of my case, that's not due to poverty. Uh, that's not due to the actions of charities. That's primarily due to factors such as government and business intervention that are going to continue to happen irrespective of whether charities involve themselves. But secondly, it's just a bigger deal because there are more people in the future. And once climate change gets going, it just revs up further and further and further. You get more storms over time. You get more famines over time. You're more likely to see erosion over time. All of the things that destroy people's lives, like when monsoons sweep through Bangladesh and are likely to displace millions of people at a time, those things get worse and worse and worse. Poverty, as it is as it is now, is getting smaller and smaller. That's why the issue of climate change is more important. So what you need to remember from that, as judges, is that because the issue of climate change is larger, even if we are relatively less efficient on solving the climate change issue, that's still a win for us because we're able to make more significant gains in people's lives. That's the first point. Turning then to relative impacts that we can have in this debate as a charity. I'm gonna bring you three points within the substantive. The, the first of those is to describe what the situation is right now with climate action and with poverty action. Climate action at the, under, under the status quo is very slow. A, because it misaligns with, with corporate and government interests. It misaligns with corporations who want to continue to produce oil, to continue to pump gas out into the atmosphere. And it misaligns with government interests who want to do short-term things and not focus on the long-term because that's less important for their electability and for their ability to stay in government. Secondly, it's not as threatening to many countries. There's some countries, for example, perhaps parts of New Zealand or for, for example, perhaps parts of Europe that aren't going to be faced necessarily with devastating action from climate change. So under the status quo, there is a lack of action on climate change. And I mean, that's just like a basic fact, right? I think we can fairly safely assert that in the debate that lots of countries are doing basically piss all to solve climate change. And that's a problem. 
versus poverty. The incentives for business and government line up squarely with solving poverty because they want to continue to grow markets so they can sell goods to more places and because they want to foster international cooperation because that's something that governments like, like to do to pat themselves on the back. The incentives line up. So there's heaps and heaps of money coming through, particularly because it's a short-term issue. You know, you know, governments get a, get a boost out of uh, solving those kinds of problems. The result of that is that there is lots and lots and lots of action on poverty. And part of that is just due to the fact that businesses don't even have to go out of their way to solve poverty, right? They just have to do the things that businesses do, like creating new jobs, like going into new places to sell their goods. And that actually is the most effective way that you're able to solve poverty. And this takes me then to the second point, which is the relative impacts that charities are able to have on solving poverty versus the relative impacts that they're able to have on solving climate change. Poverty is already being solved to a significant degree. And there are lots of groups, for example, government and business, that are solving the root causes, which are primarily economic, of that poverty. So the things that businesses do and the things that governments do by working to, together on trade and business is very efficient in solving poverty, but there is a very high per person cost to charities of solving poverty because the things that charities do are not business things. They don't give people jobs. They don't give people the opportunity to lift themselves up out of poverty and you know, solve generational problems. They do things like going into, the, into countries and handing out food and those sorts of things, which are actually very inefficient on a per person basis. Secondly, charities are a very small part of the response in, the, in, in, in this debate. Charities are much smaller than the global wealth of businesses around the world. Charities have much less power than governments around the world that are already doing the things that they are doing in an efficient way. So there's not that much of the puzzle goes away if charities step away from the action on poverty. The legwork that we've already done on poverty, the legwork that continues to be done on poverty, is for the most part going to continue to be done. Even if today every charity in the world decided that they would still just shut down, we would still see poverty dram dramatically decreasing over time. Charities are low impact on poverty. They do not have very much impact on people's lives because they're a small piece of the puzzle. Compare this with climate change. It is easier to spend money efficiently on climate change because you can go straight to root cause issues, which often are cultural and often to do with technology. You can invest in green, green technology. You can invest in media campaigns to change the way that people behave and the way that people vote in politics. You can you have a more level playing field because you're just spending money against you know against businesses and you have better fundraising in fact and this directly clashes with what will said because it's a hot button issue in many places and people feel a lot of frustration about lack of action on climate change because there's a narrative that poverty has already been solved or is already being solved so people don't feel urgent about it and because the money raises itself because if you invest in green technologies and those things become big and they become genuine alternatives to oil and gas and those sorts of things that money raises itself and recoups so you end up with more money in the long term but moreover you gain momentum as it goes along because the more people that you convince with your media campaigns the more people that you convince to turn over from oil to whatever else the more you spill over into politics you change the way that people vote you change the way that people behave in terms of their interactions with government we say charities under the status quo do very little to solve poverty we haven't heard enough from the affirmative team to explain the impact on poverty what we have proven is that the relative efficiency of spending money on climate change is much higher and given that climate change is a much bigger issue that ought to win us this debate thank you i'd like to thank the first negative speaker and invite up the second affirmative speaker to continue affirmative slide To solve the issues which the world is confronted in, then people need to be in a position to confront them themselves. They are fundamentally unable to do that when they live in a system of poverty. We tell you, not only is there a principled obligation on charity to particularly support the uplifting of those who are poor, but also that creates the most tangible benefits and actually provides longer term benefits in terms of solving climate change into the future. I'm going to be doing 
three things in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to be covering off the principle and why Sam was wrong to reject it. Secondly, I'm going to be talking about how we enable, how we um, about how we have a much larger effectiveness on charity under outside of the house and why we get more charitable donations. That will be in direct response to what we heard from First Negating. And finally, I'll be talking about how we enable response to climate change, and within that, extending upon how we create specific burdens on the government, which you remove when you have charities investing in climate change research and alleviation. Okay, firstly then, let's talk about the principle, because even though we may accept that there's a large likelihood that climate change occurs and is occurring today, we tell you that the most tangible, immediate change that people can make is to the people around them right now. We don't think that it is a complete certainty that we know for sure what's going to happen 100 years into the future. And although Sam may say, yes, but we know that like hurricanes are happening now, that's exactly the point. We don't think that we should be simply focusing on these like on manifest on the manifestations of climate change and alleviating those, we should leave it to government to help solve from the top down the actual like, underlying causes of climate change while we deal with the most immediate and tangible harms now. Furthermore, Sam never addressed the second line which we gave you, which is that the, the reason that the global elites are in a position to donate this sort of money was because the system which gave them that money was built on the back of the global poor, right? There was never a response to the fact that that, that creates a direct duty between those with the money to donate and those who need to receive the donations the most. It was not simply good enough to, for him to say, well, climate change affects the poor too. We accept that, but we say that alleviating their suffering directly is far more effective given that we're going to prove to you that um, the sorts of investment that you get only goes to rich countries. Okay, secondly then, on the effectiveness of charity. Note, speakers, Sam gave literally no response to the central mechanisms which Will brought to you in his speech. And that was that the structure of charities and the people who donate to them meant that it was far more likely to get actual donations when we were talking about poverty, that it was tangible and measurable, that for the rich that this allowed them to see results and for businesses it allowed them to put something on their website of wells being built in Africa. They were far more likely to want to buy in and donate to that. But also for the middle class, right? It's far more easy to donate and to, like, to have that empathy with a vision of somebody who you're helping and feeling like you have a direct connection to them rather than simply like, potentially helping people 50 years down the track if the scientists don't manage to waste away all their money and not find the solution to the particular problem they're trying to solve, right? So we think that given that there's far more certainty in terms of poverty alleviation, we get more donations. So crucially, that was really important because it meant that even if there was a one-to-one -one ratio of effectiveness of like uh, of inputs into like your donations of climate change and poverty, we got far more benefits under our side of the house because there was simply a greater total number of donations for alleviating poverty. So then what did he want to say? He essentially wanted to say that there were incentives that exist to solve poverty that like exist irrespective of charitable donations. We tell you that is simply not the case. Poverty is still a massive issue, and don't let Sam tell you that just because some governments have been able to modernize, particularly when this is like largely done by the growth of like countries like China and India, there are still hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. In fact, like most, like over half the world's population who have, you know, who are learning, who are earning literal, literally dollars every day and have barely enough to feed their families. We tell you that governments in poor countries are not able to lift them out of poverty themselves, as Sam would like to say. These charitable institutions, crucially, have in place from decades of experience the sort of infrastructure that allows them to go into these countries and actually make a tangible difference. That is the thing of like Doctors Without Borders and, 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 and organizations which actually have the experience being able to make tangible change in that sense. Furthermore, we tell you that when you have these countries donating, it's, it actually props up the institutions within those countries to be able to actually lift themselves out of poverty, right? So when we have a large charity going into a country, they would be able to provide the sort of support that can create the stable medical institutions and governmental institutions. 
where was never a response to Will's point that the type of investment that we get when we are investing in climate change goes to the countries which already have the infrastructure to support that investment. Poor countries don't have the infrastructures to support that. It is far, far better that they are able to do that on their own terms. And that brings me to the third point about enabling the response to climate change. Because even if we accept that climate change is the biggest problem in the world, we were the side that uniquely solved that yesterday. Why was that? We were the side that established institutions first. But secondly, we were the side that empowered local infrastructure to actually make this sort of change, right? We tell you when people are lifted out of poverty and gain education, that is when you have a clustering of knowledge in these countries to be able to, to, to solve the local climate change issues pertinent to them. We don't think it's good enough for Sam to simply say, well, you know, climate change is climate change, right? Like it's not all the same, right? So we think for many developed countries, there are, there are problems which are specific to them, which are best solved by them. Problems about how to make their specific crops grow in different seasons after climate change. How do it like support their own ecosystems, which they have the best knowledge about? Crucially, they are only put in a position to address those problems when they aren't struggling, right? That is when we get good institutions when they aren't struggling to feed themselves. That is when we can actually they can actually focus on climate change. That brings me on to my explicit extension, which is how we create a bigger burden on the government under our side of the house. Two reasons that, that is the case. Firstly, under the status quo. Governments can pass off the burden of addressing climate change because they can say that it's going to come from the bottom up or it's going to come from these large like international charities. We tell you that what, what the reason that this occurs is because, because often governments claim the results of charities which originate in their own borders and actually claim their accomplishments as being their own. We tell you that it is disastrous that governments aren't being forced to address that on their own terms. But secondly, and crucially, when voters are richer and when there are more stable financial and governmental institutions, that is when they're able to start caring about climate change. It is no coincidence that the richer countries in the world, in Scandinavia and in New Zealand, for example, are the sorts of countries who are able to, vote, to devote time and money into creating top-down change in terms of regulations and changing public behavior. That is how we get actual change in this debate. At the end of my speech, I've shown you not only is the burden on charities to support the poor, it is also far more effective in getting donations and solving climate change. That is why we're gonna to win today's debate. I'd like to thank the second uh, affirmative speaker and invite up the second negative speaker to continue negative side. Guys, hear me? There's a fatal flaw in their case in which they think that private companies going to Africa and building a well is equivalent to building industries which will save those global poor when climate change is impending. What's really going to happen is that that well will provide water for one generation and at the end of that generation climate change will have led to sandstorms uh, flowing through their cities and leading to those vulnerable people in no better situation, in fact worse. Three questions I'm going to ask today. First one, looking at their principle. Secondly, effectiveness at solving poverty, and then thirdly, effectiveness at solving climate change. Firstly, let's look at this principle. They told you the basic thrust of their principle was, well, as charities, we should be reducing suffering. And we kind of agree, like, that's what the debate's about. However, we tell you that, they tell you two things under this. Firstly, that we need to reduce current suffering. 
we tell you that climate change is leading to people suffering now, that people, there's already climate change refugees all across the world, that sea levels are rising, that crops are failing. Secondly, we tell you that it is certain that climate change is going to impact in the future. They tell you, oh, we don't quite know where the hurricane's going to be, so we have no reason to go and address it. We tell you that the point is, is that by addressing climate change now, we can stop a hurricane happening in the first place, that we can stop those millions of future generations, generations who we have a responsibility to protect as we're the ones causing climate change. That fits into their second um, piece of analysis about how apparently colonialism has given us some burden to solve global poverty. Firstly, because we solve global poverty, we'll show you why that um, doesn't fit into the debate. And secondly, by their own metric, as the uh, countries, the people presumably who've started uh, industry, who've increased like oil industries, who engage in consumerism, we also cause climate change. We cause it to have those terrible impacts on all of the world's poor, and therefore we have the burden to assist them. At the end of the day, this principle doesn't really matter because what both teams want is to solve the situation and um, to like lead to less harm to most people. That's what's going to win the debate today. So let's talk about that. Firstly, let's talk about poverty. They told us. Um, hmm. There go. Okay. They told us a couple of things. They told us that charities... Um, are going to solve poverty by simply like dipping into their pool of money. However, as I told you in my intro, those types of things don't just solve poverty. You get solving of poverty when um, they give you a couple of mechanism stories. So they told you that results were immediate, that uh, people could see um, like sob stories of the child that they've saved in Africa and that, um, that for some reason you have marginal returns under climate change. Firstly, they didn't give us any actual mechanism. They just stated the economic principle. This it directly uh, goes against the principle that we gave you about the actual diminishing marginal returns you have um, when you give to poverty because as we told you, you don't actually improve the lives of those people. You might build one well, but that well is never going to lead to them not having a, uh, like not having industry in their town. It's never going to do the types of things that companies and governments already have incentives upon them to do. So that's where you actually have to measure your marginal returns. A couple of other points of uh, rebuttal here. The first one is that, um, it's not true that, so yeah, so you still basically get all those issues under poverty under their house, the, their side of the house. We told you in comparison that businesses and governments actually solve poverty, that they have incentives, which they, we have gave you a variety of mechanisms, which we did not hear response to any of them. Sam told you about how companies have direct incentives to continue to create industries in these places as they make profit. Um, so they create jobs and trade, the types of things that will actually bring people out of poverty. We also gave you reasons as to why private companies are bad. Once again, they did not respond to these mechanisms. We talked about how they um, like can't solve the root problems, such as war, such as corruption, such as like um, structural issues in those countries, such as geographic isolation. Um, we told you that... Um, private charities uh, like about diminishing marginal returns so how like they have to keep working at the issue and nothing happens. At the end of this point we've told you that poverty is solved when you have consistent efforts by governments. It's important to note here that poverty has been improving over time. In the past hundred years the state of most people in the world has gotten so much better and that's likely to continue as industry grows so long as the state of the world is acceptable and that's why the most important thing is to solve climate change so that these people do have a chance to grow those industries, to have help by companies and institutions not just private charities. So let's talk about effectiveness at solving at solving climate change. Once again, we gave you mechanisms as to why private companies were not effective at solving, um, as to why governments were not effective at solving climate change. They did not respond to these. We told you that they have corporate interests to continue to pollute. We told you that these were long-term issues which governments deny or choose to 
um, not to invest in. Think about Donald Trump, think about the president of Brazil, literally saying that climate change doesn't exist because they can't be bothered um, finding ways to look into it. Things that, once again, it's going to hurt the worst, the world's poor more. Finally, um, that it's not actually that threatening to rich companies, to rich countries, so like governments just don't do anything. This directly contradicts with his split about how apparently uh, governments then have the burden when private charities are doing nothing. Couple of, he said two things. The first one was that um, uh, so voters would care more and so charities would like when, when charities care, voters will care and they'll force people to come, um, force governments to make good policy. That's just not true because when like voters work out what they care about based on the pamphlets that are being put in the mail on the ads on Facebook. And if all of them are for uh, the global poor, they don't actually think about climate change. However, when they no longer uh, get their share, fair share of like, I've done my good for the world by sponsoring their child in Africa, they have to start thinking about what's actually going to assist those children in Africa. As we've told you time and time again, it's fixing climate change. That's how you get um, impetus from voters. That's how you get people to care about that. We gave you mechanisms once again as to why charity is the most effective way to solve climate change. None of these are responded to. Let's talk about them. Firstly, that it's a pool of money in which you can actually invest in solutions which will help climate change. Things like fundraising, like lobbying companies and governments, like investing in green technology, like investing in people learning to uh, like not be so consumerist or whatever. We told you that... Um, uh, so we gave you all of these mechanisms. Um, what did they tell you? They told you we're going to solve poverty through establishing local institutions. The important thing to note here is that you can't just establish an industry through a pool of charity money. You have to establish industry over time with government and company help. Charity must go towards making future changes. And the way to do that is by lobbying um, for climate change. Okay, I'd like to thank the second negative speaker and invite up the third affirmative speaker to conclude the substantive portion of their side. To borrow the word fatal flaw from side negative, because that side has a fatal flaw too. And the fatal flaw in this debate is they haven't actually solved climate change on their side of the house. Why? Note that all their solutions, particularly Sam's material at first negating, was all about how you solve climate change in Western contexts. So you get maybe you get some lobbying and political change in Western governments. Maybe you get people to change their eating habits. Note what this doesn't address. This doesn't address what Will set up for you at first affirming that per capita solutions to climate change don't matter, just only matter in this debate, but solving the entire output of climate change matters. And here's the problem. It's developing countries like China, like India, like South America, where the other side needs to fix. Because if those countries continue to pollute and pollute the environment, if they build coal power plants because they need to provide electricity for their people, that side can't win the debate because they haven't solved climate change and the climate change problems that that side of the house wants to claim are going to fix and work in those communities don't work. From third to gating, we need a clear response about how they get climate change fixed in developing countries as well. Three things. One, going to address the principle. Secondly, I'm going to expand on that climate change analysis and why their climate change solutions don't work. And thirdly, why we get more effective spending on our side of the house. One, what do we principally care about? Okay, we just heard a speaker who said, you build a well, who cares? Look, I'm sorry, building a well provides water for that community, for hundreds of people in that community, stops them from getting cholera and literally stops them from dying. Okay, like, like but, 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 also, it actually builds into the development narrative, right? Because if they don't have to walk three hours every day to collect water, they can have education and actually do things that benefit and go and engage their life. Okay, 
what is the root of this analysis shows? It shows they have a flawed understanding of whether poverty is being solved. Because let's deal with Sam's case. Sam wanted to say that charities do nothing to solve poverty alleviation. Polio eradication, which was a killing disease that killed hundreds and not millions of people a year, was eradicated through the work of Rotary and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. What they said simply doesn't like, like understand fundamental truths. Why is this important material? Because Sam's lying when he says poverty is being solved. It might be easy enough to live in our bubbles in New Zealand and Australia and Asia and say that poverty is being solved, but it's not. Finally, just some other things. Like they want to claim numeric impact. We on our side of the house want to talk about scale of impact, right? Because we're probably talking about more of this on our side of the house, but we're also probably talking about more consistent problems and more consistent issues. Also in terms of future people, look, we've got future people affected by poverty who are born every day into poverty. Okay, let's talk about improving climate change. Note how drastic that side of the house wants to claim. Like, firstly, we think they probably overplayed slightly the extent of the climate change problem. But because they've overplayed the problem, the solution is also massive. On their side of the house, they literally have to fix climate change to get solutions. They have to stop the hurricanes from getting worse and stop the storms from getting worse. All we have to show on our side of the house is we get improvements in terms of the expanding and the outcomes. Like clearly you get outcomes from spending on our side of the house. It's their side of the house, which is questionable outcomes. So you've got to, for them to win this debate, be convinced they've got a clear and effective path that probably on the balance of probabilities would solve in climate change because the only benefit they get in this debate is if they can solve climate change from impacting their communities. Why does this stuff not work? Uh, I've misplaced my material. Okay, um, okay, firstly, in terms of, uh, oh, sorry. Now, so, so Sam's stuff focused on poverty alleviation in Western countries, right? And so what we tell you further here is that actually what the, the, the core change that needs to happen is we need people in lower income countries to have sufficient income that they stop worrying about their immediate survival and have the ability to worry about their future survival where they can make voting decisions that prioritize the environment as well as their ordinary lives. That side of the house has no answer to that problem, except to say that governments are already eliminating poverty. Look, we know that's a bit of a joke. I'll deal with that later in my speech. What did they say? Well, they wanted to talk like, they, they, all they had besides like lobbying and like changing Western governments was they had poverty, like technology. Let's talk about technology. The first thing we say about technology are those technologies are probably going to uh, help Western people, right? Let's look at where business and innovation is happening. It's happening in like electric cars, but an electric car isn't the problem if you literally can't afford to buy food or sustain it. The point is businesses are going to invest in climate change technology and solutions that can make money, that have a benefit. Those places are best in the West. That's just exactly the same as like health and drug production, where drug production goes to the places where it needs to, that's overseas. Okay. Uh, finally, what was our path to victory here? Yeah, so we've got a clear path to victory. We alleviate poverty, and I'm going to prove that in my last point. Just finally, in terms of why we think developing countries are going to become, like, clearly 5 billion, or like, the vast majority of the world's population lives in these developing countries, so that's where they've got to fix. Okay, let's talk about more effective spending. The first lie we heard from them was that governments are sp like have the money that they can spend the money to solve problems in these communities. Sam, if governments could do it alone in these countries, why do these governments need foreign aid? Why these governments literally, why can't they provide food parcels to every person who lives in that country? Oh wait, it's because governments don't have the solution to that. But we tell you two contextual things, that, or three contextual things that are changing about the world. The first is that these countries are highly indebted. They're highly indebted to foreign governments who they own money to, whether that's China through One Belt or One Road or the IMF, so they can't afford that. But two other contextual things. One, we tell you that COVID is probably impacting these countries the worst, right? The entirety of the informal economy of India is literally shut down and people are dying. These countries, particularly as we go out of the economic crisis we're currently in, don't have the money. But secondly, in terms of nationalism, foreign governments and countries like the USA and others are putting less and less money into foreign aid. That means that there's less money funding the schemes that that side of the house claim that we're working. On our side of the house, we tell you that these private charities have a huge amount of money that they need to invest in solving the problems in these communities, and they're going to fill a really essential gap. Okay, let's talk about effectiveness of spending. That side of the house wants to berate us for saying that our solutions didn't provide long-term economic development. First of all, we think saving lives is probably a pretty important benefit for long-term economic development. But secondly, like there are lots of cost-effective measures that do improve economic development. 
i.e. contraception. Contraception, which is cheap and affordable, means that the community doesn't have to carry as many people. That probably reduces the impact of famine and other things. Education in these communities means that people can access jobs and access the international economy. Economic, and just like that side of the house wants to claim, Economic development is also self-fulfilling on our side of the house, right? If we provide micro loans for businesses, that money cycles around in the economy and has the same types of benefits and outcome for that side of the house. Okay, finally, in terms of how we get more money directly into this. Look, they didn't really have a response to any of our, like, like a clear analysis that worked here, right? Because we told you that it's far easier to get money when you've got clear KPIs for things you can prove. The problem that exists on their side of the house is the KPIs are weighted towards a Western world and the world that they live in, or alternatively, like just like going to be on green technologies for them. So that side of the house isn't going to do it. Instead, we get more people investing more money into private charities that benefit these communities and businesses keep spending their money in the correct place. Finally, that side of the house wanted to talk about enabling businesses. Look, we think it's much better for charities to be in these communities, to act as checks and balances on the working conditions of people in these communities and make sure those businesses are operating in a sustainable way because Nike is certainly not the one who's going to lift the economic development of people in these communities. I need an answer on how we fix climate change in developing countries. Side Affirmative has the only one we propose. All right, I'd like to thank the third affirmative speaker and invited the third negative speaker to conclude the substantive portion of their side. We just heard Third Affirmative close out their case by asking the question, we, by saying that we need an answer on how our side of the house but fixes climate change in developing countries. I'm here to tell you that the premise of that question is fundamentally flawed and that plays into why we have won this debate today. The answer is we don't fix climate change in developing countries and we don't fix climate change in developed countries, we fix climate change, period. We do not live on two separate planets, the two are inexorably linked and every dollar that we spend towards fighting climate change, whether it's in a developing country, whether it's in a developed country, regardless, helps fix climate change. Why is this? It's because we all breathe the same atmosphere, every like bit of CO2 we get out of the atmosphere helps everyone, but secondly, if we're talking about investing in green technology, technology, even if that investment happens in countries like New Zealand or UK or US, that technology could, can still be available to help in climate change, fight climate change efforts in countries like India. Three points of clash for you today. Um, firstly, AFS principle and why it's essentially irrelevant in this debate. Secondly, are charities actually more impactful at fighting climate change than poverty in terms of the time factor and the money spent? And thirdly, does that fighting poverty actually help us fight climate change, because this is really what a lot of AFS case rests on. They cannot tell you that climate change isn't a huge monumental issue. They have been unable to, they, they cannot rebut the scientific fact that if we don't stop climate change, there's going to be catastrophic consequences for the planet far beyond that of poverty. So that what they need, what their case rests on fundamentally is the idea that by fighting poverty, we are, we're going to help fight climate change too. And I'm gonna show you why that's not true. But firstly, on the AFS principle and why it's irrelevant, what did we hear? We heard two, two parts of this principle. Firstly, the idea that victims of climate change aren't suffering right now, and we should focus on reducing suffering right now. Two responses to this. Firstly, people are currently suffering. Um, look at wildfires, droughts, extreme weather events like hurricanes. People are already dying in the thousands, so we think that their lives matter too. But secondly, they never backed up the principle of why, of why a person's life in the future matters less than the person's life now. Secondly, this idea that um, we have a duty to fight poverty because, because private charities are in this position because of global capitalism. We think the exact same thing applies to climate change because countries got rich from things like oil and coal. So the exact same principle applies under our side of the house, and this really just falls out of the bay. Now to move on to the more impactful point of whether or not charities are more impactful at fighting climate change, we gave you a variety of mechanisms in this, both in the sense of fundraising, how we're able to better keep money flowing into this issue, but also how corporations and governments are uniquely positioned to help with poverty when more often than not they actually um, a harm in, in fighting climate change, and so we need to step up as private charities to fill that role. So what did we hear from... Um, uh, they told us that governments in developing countries have been unsuccessful at fighting poverty. They tried to tell us that poverty is not on is not on the decline. This is completely false. Extreme poverty is halved in the last 20 years. Um, what has happened with economic conditions in some African countries in China and India is nothing short of a miracle. And while private and while private charity certainly hasn't hurt, the large part of 
these gains can be attributed to efforts by governments to help their, their economies grow. And we think that the idea that when they suggest that because some of these countries still need foreign aid, that means they're not successful at fighting climate change, their governments aren't effective. The idea that because the Kenyan government still needs some food to help feed its people means it hasn't made extraordinary gains over the last 40 years is completely ridiculous. We come back to the idea that currently poverty is decreasing rapidly and climate change and CO2 emissions are getting far, far worse. So on that basis alone, we think it is far more important, even if our actual impact on dollars spent is exactly the same. We think that we don't win the debate simply because here we have one, we have two problems, one which is getting far better and one which is getting far worse. So what else did they tell us? They told us that um, that um, our, our model doesn't solve climate change because we focus on Western countries and therefore that's inefficient. Three responses to this. Firstly, a lot of the big companies that are responsible for the pollution um, that um, that causes climate change are based in the West by pushing for better regulation in the West and lobbying these countries, we're able to attack the root causes of climate change. Two, as I said, green investment is something that can happen worldwide. Any investment that we make in green technology and breakthroughs we make on alternative fuels in no matter what the country can be used to fight climate change worldwide. But thirdly, we never said that we were only focusing on Western countries. We think that it is perfectly possible for us to make similar efforts in terms of investing in green technology and lobbying companies and governments in developing countries. We can do that in India, we can do that um, wherever there is the possibility. So what have we shown you on this point? We've shown you that um, that charities are more impactful on fighting climate change because there are incentives that act on corporations and governments, profit incentives to keep um, to like keep using fossil fuels. And so we need to act to stop that. Whereas in, in, when it comes to poverty, corporations and governments are far more successful at this. Why is this? Well, we've given you a variety of mechanisms, including the idea that, um, that, that governments and corporations are able to provide things that charities simply can't. Um, simply can't. They are able to attack the root causes of these issues in a way that charities can't. Charities can provide things to people, but they can't give jobs, they can't build infrastructures, they can't build democracies in the same way that the governments and the actual people of these countries can. And it's interesting here that, um, so this brings bring me on, my, on to my third point about how poverty um, Neg is trying to, AF is trying to claim that poverty actually helps us fight climate change. They told us that we need to lift people out of poverty in these countries and build stable institutions. And we want to turn these poor African and Asian countries into, you know, um, countries like Scandinavia and New Zealand. Um, we think that, again, it is the governments and corporations in these countries that are best. It is firstly in their interest to build robust um, market um, based economies where they can make the most money and where they can have a thriving populace. But also, we think that. It, this is really telling because when AF said that their goal in terms of building up these countries and eradicating poverty in these countries so they'll be rich enough to fight climate change, when they use the example of Sweden and New Zealand, it's important to know that yes, Sweden and New Zealand are some of the richest countries in the world and we still are not fulfilling our basic obligations when it comes to fighting climate change. If their whole model is let's make every country in the world rich enough to fight climate change like New Zealand is, we're going to be completely screwed because New Zealand, with all of our wealth, is not, is not doing enough to fight climate change and that is exactly because the mechanisms we provided you about why corporations um, about why corporations simply have incentives to keep polluting and uh, and lobby governments to um, to not do enough about it. So what else did they tell us? Um, they told us so. Um, so this again comes back to the core thesis of their, of their case about how helping poverty. Um, um, helps us fight climate change. They told us at third that economic development is self-fulfilling on their side because they have thing, things like micro loans. But again, what, char what charities are continually doing in these countries is they're going to a village, they're going to an area, a region, they're providing, they're, they're giving out money, they're giving out resources, but then the, the structural reasons for why these places are in poverty in the first place, some of which now, by the way, include, ch include climate change. It's no longer just war and famine that have gone on for thousands of years. There are places like Iraq and Iran where desertification is happening, which is making these places poorer right now and so they go in they try and help make these places better but the structural reasons the root causes for poverty that have existed for a long time still come back and still and make and make this a constant battle whereas we think alternatively with climate change the um Sorry. So with poverty, it's the, it's the government and the corporations in these areas who have the best incentives to act on this and are currently improving the situation. Whereas on climate change, it is only through private charity that we're really able to make the steps right now that we need to, because globally, governments and charities have failed. And that is really what this debate comes down to. It's charities are, are 
the, pu the function of private charities is to step up where the institutions, predominantly governments, that are supposed to keep people healthy, keep have people have food on the table, and protect us from things like climate change, have failed. Are they failing in the fight against poverty? No. Af would like to tell you that because some people in Africa are still poor, that means they failed. We are going to tell you that they have seen huge gains. What we, but what we are seeing is we are seeing huge, pro we are seeing huge losses of life and losses of economic growth due to climate change, and that is a problem that no government in the entire world is doing enough to. And so on that basis alone, regardless of all the material we brought up to you about how um, charities are more impactful on a per dollar basis in terms of fighting climate change, means that we should step up and fill that niche because no one else is going to and it's our planet. I'd like to thank the third negative speaker and invite up the negative reply to wrap up negative side. The central challenge that faces the affirming team at the end of this debate can be expressed quite simply. It is to say, in the coming decades, large swathes of the Middle East are going to become completely unlivable as water dries up, as land is turned into desert, as places where people have lived for thousands of years are no longer able to sustain human life. That means millions of people that are going to be displaced around the globe. That means millions of people that are going to lose their jobs. It means millions of people who are going to starve, who are going to be forced into conflict. And the reality is this, the incentives that exist on business and on government are misaligned with that issue. They are not solving that issue and they lack the capacity to solve that issue. What we say in this debate is that there is an opportunity that exists for private charity to make a sustained and, and, and meaningful difference in the fight against climate change in a way that is likely to save Maybe not everyone, you know, maybe it's not going to end climate change forever, but maybe it will make significant enough changes that in the long term we're able to save many, many more lives than the number of people that in the short term are solved through helping poverty by charity. So I'm going to talk through this reply in two, two branches. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the way that charities interact with poverty. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about the way that charities interact with, are likely to interact with climate change. And I'm going to compare the two. Firstly, then let's turn to poverty. There's a few things to say here. The basic mechanism by which charities operate in solving poverty is relatively simple. It says we collect money off of people that have money and we give that money in various ways by providing resources and those sorts of things to people who do not have that money. The problem that exists, historically has existed and continues to exist for these charities is exactly the types of things that you know Zach wanted to talk about. Uh, not Zach, rather, it was, it was more Will and Nick. Zach actually sensibly dropped the material. It was about the fact that the way that charities fundraise is by you know, showing pictures of starving child in Uganda. So that is the things that they do, right? They pack up big pot bags of rice and take them off to Uganda and then hand them out. They do things like building wells. And, you know, per Zach's, uh, you know, per his intro, obviously it's horrific to say that, you know, we ought not do those things, right? Obviously it is a tough call to say that it is inefficient to just give food to people because you get stuck in a rut and continual spending on the same people. But because of the fact that you get stuck in that rut, because charities are inefficient in the way that they build infrastructure, because they don't give people jobs that allow them to feed their families. They don't give people significant, you know, build up of infrastructure in countries that allow countries to build up industries. Those are the sorts of things that businesses do. What charities do is get stuck in inefficient projects, saving the same people over and over and over. So the per, per the, the, the money that you're spending on these people is significant, and ultimately you are not saving that many lives. And that's especially true when you consider the fact that the money that is already given, even to those inefficient projects by governments through, through aid to other countries, is already significantly larger than that that is given by charities. The fact of the matter is, Yes, charities save some people. Yes, that is absolutely applaudable in isolation. And, you know, in isolation, that's a great thing. But the reality is, as I said in my first speech, if charity went away today, poverty would still be on significant decline. Millions of people would still come out of, of, of that poverty. Compare this now with climate change. We provide potential global fixes. That's investment in green technology, which grows the pie overall. If you can do things like provide alternatives to natural gas and oil that are cheaper than those things, that changes the way that industry operates globally. If you are able to change the regulations in countries that the big corporations of the world come from, such as the United States and such as China, you get bigger and bigger changes over time. The way that the world does industry, the way that the world does climate change and is causing climate change, changes in a way that is likely to make some positive change. Ultimately, 
This is an issue, climate change, that does not fix itself. If you care about keeping people out of poverty, if you care about people being able to feed themselves, you ought to solve the problem that is going to cause people's crops to fail, that is going to cause people to have to leave their homes, that is going to cause millions of people to die. If you care about human life, you should choose to be efficient, even if that means saying no to someone who needs food. All right, I'd like to thank the negative reply and invite the affirmative reply to wrap up their side and indeed this entire debate. Walk down the streets of Accra or Chennai or Nairobi and you'll see people burning their trash and creating air pollution. There's no rubbish bins on the street because as soon as governments implemented them, people stole the bins to use as containers for drinking water. This is the reality of climate change and global poverty. Maybe building a well would mean that these people don't have to travel five kilometers for water every day and don't need that bin. Maybe it means that they have the time to actually get educated and actually have the ability to lobby their governments to put in some climate change restrictions or even just sacrifice some things in order to help the planet. That's just the reality that will never exist in the reality of the negative team because the reality of the negative team is a reality that neglects the causation of these issues. And that's why we're the team that ultimately is gonna win this debate. Three points of clash. Firstly, let's talk about the duty of ch charities, then about the effectiveness of charities for climate change uh, compared to poverty. And let's talk about, and finally about the spillover effects onto the other issues. So whether uh, fighting for poverty helps change uh, climate change. Firstly, duty of charities. We said firstly they had a duty to specifically to the poor because of colonialism. Uh, Neg said that climate change affects poor people too. But the point here is it only affected them because they were poor, right? And at best solving either of those problems would fix this, right? So if we can prove that we get more change to either, we still win under this analysis. But secondly, we told you about utilitarian prioritization of the suffering that is happening now, right? Because they told us in response that well, you get more future victims of climate change. Not only that, there's like current suffering from bushfires and stuff. Like 20 people died from the bushfires in Australia. That's just not a comparable harm. And even if there's more like deaths in the future from climate change, there's still going to be more suffering from poverty. And importantly, what Zach said was more consistent suffering to people over the course of their entire lifetime. Poverty is more imminent, more pressing, and it's easier to solve. And let's talk about why it is easier to solve. Let's talk about the effectiveness of charities for climate change and poverty. Because let's step away from the new analysis we heard at Reply and look at what we actually said in this debate. Because we told you that poverty char charities that focus on poverty are much more effective for a number of reasons. Because they're able to get more donors because they have an exponentially higher marginal return for what they're using their money for. Because climate investment, climate change investment goes to rich countries and rich people in those countries developing technologies that cost a lot of money and only solves rich countries issues. Because climate change investments and regulation needs to be top down from governments in order to actually be effective. And because businesses are more likely to work with poverty charity than with climate change charity that restricts their activities. At third, they had some new things to say here. They said that climate change is a global problem and by fixing it in the West, we'll fix it everywhere. But we quite clearly told you that even if Western emissions go down, that like because you haven't solved poverty, the emissions still go up in LEDCs in a rate that you can't stop climate change. But even at their best, they only affect mitigation, not adaption, right? The reality is that we can never eliminate the effects of climate change given the position we're in now. And we've told you that it's better to give people the ability to actually like live fulfilling lives in a world where climate change exists. What then did they say? Well, green tech can be applied globally, like Delhi and Nigeria, but like that just wasn't true, right? It was too expensive. And long-term we told you you get more innovation if you have educated people in developing nations. At third, they told us governments had failed on climate change, so charities need to step in. The point to recognize at the end of this point is that charities can't step in effectively and that governments are equally failing on poverty too, an issue where charities actually have been making tangible change that eliminates suffering 
But let's talk about how a tangible change quickly also uh, affects climate change. Because we give the poor a voice to pressure governments. We give the poor an ability to sacrifice things for climate change when they wouldn't have otherwise been uh, able to. This was never adequately responded to by the negating team, which is why at the end of this debate, not only are we the most effective at tackling the most important issue, but we also do a whole lot more to tackle climate change than we think even the negating team could do. Proud to affirm. All right, I'd like to thank the negative reply and indeed all speakers in this debate. Uh, this is an excellent debate and I'd now like to ask all speakers and spectators to jump out this Zoom call so that us judges can